There's a lover in the story, but the story's still the same. There's a lover. Does that look funny? Suffering and a yeah. Paradox to blame. That whole, that whole mask is hilarious. In the scriptures, and it's not some idle claim. So is your face. I didn't know yeah. I had permission. Oh. Got my mask. To me. <laughs> you oh, I can't. I still have smoke coming out. Oh, this, this has got to be part of the actual podcast. <laughs> you can't cut this out. Riddle me this, Sasha Hawks. What has 31 episodes and premieres tonight? That is, Out of Print Slashers featuring myself, Sean Campbell, and the 80s slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. How are you doing tonight? Pretty good, Sean. How are you doing, bitch? I'm doing pretty good. Could not find any orange hair dye, so <laughs> here we go. <laughs> oh, God. Who is Batman? If, yeah, the... knowledge, if knowledge is power. And a then god. I... Am. <sighs> I could probably I could probably quote and act out that entire movie. See, I like I like Batman Forever. I don't like Batman and Robin, but I like Batman Forever. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm and if you're looking for if you while we're talking about novelizations for tonight, if you want to read a dark novelization, the novelization of Batman Forever is pretty fucking dark. Actually, a, lot, a, lot, a lot more murder in it. I'm actually going to narrate those novelizations on the channel later on. So, it's going to be, uh, the whole channel's going to be just movie novelizations and tie-in books. So. Well, exactly. How else are we going to have an episode next year? <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. I got a lot of, uh, a lot of other stuff planned out, like uh, author retrospectives, where we have, like, Nancy Kilpatrick, David Bergantino, people like that on to talk about their careers. Retrospective on movie. No, we need to do, though. What's that? We have got to do at least one episode when we're actually in the same room. <laughs> yes, that, that'd, that'd be pretty cool. Not right stuff, now. Stuff no for offense, year. but not stuff right now. for next year. Uh, I love our idea for the uh, Halloween costume next year, man. That that last one that's going to be fun. Oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah, tonight we're talking about Halloween Four by Nicholas Grabowski, and we have an exclusive interview with the author. We're going to be playing tonight on the podcast for you. So that's going to be fun. What did you think of this novelization when you first uh, read it or heard it, Sean? I thought it was a pretty straight adaptation of the movie. I mean, granted, I hadn't seen the movie in some time, so I didn't remember a lot of that. I know there's a lot of extra meat in the opening scenes when they're in the asylum. I know that there was the extra release of this book that had extra chapters talking about what happened to the priest that Loomis runs into when he gets the ride um, but yeah, like he was saying in the interview, um, he didn't, de he didn't, uh, deviate a lot from the original screenplay. Cause I know a lot of times when we look into these novelizations, we're not sure if they're going to go out of left field, if they're going to work on a screenplay we haven't seen before, or if it's going to be closer to the movie. So we honestly don't know. Um, so that was interesting getting to speak to, um, Nicholas Grabowski, the author of this book. Yeah. And finding out exactly how things went down. Uh, some some crazy stuff I didn't know about, uh, which you're going to get to hear about. But as far as the book goes, I enjoyed the uh, added <coughs> the added stuff we had with uh, Sayer uh, in in the book compared to the movie, and the appearance of Laurie Strode uh, later in the book. Um, I'm sorry, man. You have got to be the Freddy Krueger with the cleanest teeth I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> like, this is a Freddy Krueger Colgate commercial, because usually they're burned and charred. You have, like, a perfect set of teeth uh, with, like, this burned-ass face, so it's almost like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the mouth is supposed to, like, be one piece with, like, the bad teeth and not open, but yeah. I couldn't breathe when I wore it, so I cut the mouth out. I cut well, I was going to do the same thing with my Leatherface mask, because it, it it's a built-in mouth, but like you said, it really limits how much you can interact with people so I i'd cut that out too jaw. i can move the jaw on this a little bit yeah it, it looks really it, good for aesthetics it was this mask or for 15 dollars or 500 dollars or more for the like the piece that goes over the shoulders and everything yeah it's just a little too much this one goes here but i think it looks pretty damn good uh for oh yeah bucks you know gets the job done um yeah, I want to play a clip from the book, though. We're not going to go in order or anything, because uh, the interview is really the hot topic tonight. Uh, but I want to play a clip of the added scene of John Sayer when he goes to the police station. Uh, I'm going to play a clip. I'm going to like, combine them. 
he goes there trying to uh, find Loomis. And uh, then a bunch of stuff goes down, and we find out the fate of, of, uh, of Sayer in the book. And I want to play these like combined clips because uh, his, uh, I don't really want to say death, uh, but that scene's pretty brutal and uh, way different than the movie because he's not even, you know, he doesn't play but that big of a part in the movie. Uh, so, yeah, I want to play that clip if you don't care. Yeah, go ahead. Roll it. Jack Sayer awoke, startled, choking momentarily on his own saliva, which caused him to cough out yellow phlegm over his steering wheel. A dark dream escaped him as consciousness embraced him with the chilly nighttime air. A soft web of spotlight streamed down from a fixture embedded upon the side of the First Presbyterian Church of Haddonfield, illuminating the vacant lot nearby and Sayer's pickup truck beneath. As immediately as reality gripped him, he was overwhelmed by two distinct thoughts. He had passed out while watching for Loomis, which foiled the purpose of the entire stakeout, and something oblong and black was writhing and flailing between his legs at his crotch. He jolted upwards in sheer fright, shrieking, his hands moving to brush it away, whatever it was. He calmed enough to take a good look at it. He picked it up. It was a wind-up rubber rat. Five young teenagers burst into a chorus of laughter beyond the open driver's window, and the reverend nearly cursed to Almighty God before he caught himself. He flung the toy below the glove compartment. The kids scurried quickly away from his pickup, all of them garbed in Halloween attire and glowing face paint. One of them stopped running for a moment, pushed aside his Dracula cape, and spit out a set of vampire teeth. "'Trick or treat, old man!' he exclaimed and ran off to join his peers in the distant dark. Jack Sayer was alone, and it became quiet again, even more quiet than when he'd first arrived. He stared out his windshield out past the street and at the front door of the tranquil police station. Well, damn it to all eternal hip, he spat, and he groped for his whiskey bottle. He found it uncapped and brought it to his lips, his eyes canvassing the surroundings and his mind struggling to come to terms with what to do next. His eyes caught sight of a tow truck resting vacant and silent at the opposite side of the garbage dumpster that he'd parked beside. He looked, but there was nobody around. Sayer's fatigue was all but spent from the rudely abrupt wake-up call, but a mild hangover and another plan soon festered in his brain. He leaned over and fetched a towel, absently wiped off the running wetness from the steering wheel. Discarding the towel, he reached into his glove compartment for a pair of reading glasses. Hell, he didn't need them. All the reading he ever did was of the good book anyway. Besides, the Reader's Digest and the National Enquirer, and he knew the Lord's Word by heart, cover to cover, verse by verse, at least on his good days. From now on, those glasses belong to Dr. Loomis. That's it, the old reverend devised. I'm going to walk right into that there station, let him know the good doctor left his glasses in my cab, and ask for his whereabouts so as I can deliver them proper back into his hands. Whether the plan worked or not, it was up to Jesus. He discarded his whiskey and emerged from the cab. As he shut the door of his vehicle, he gave the abandoned tow truck a second glance. Gripping the spectacles, he made his way across the street and towards the entrance of the police station. A sole sheriff sedan sat in the parking lot as he passed it. He arrived at the front door and entered the station. Inside, Deputy Pierce rose up from his desk to the front counter to immediately meet him. Uh, can I help you? Maybe you can help me, the reverend spoke, adjusted his clergy collar, and let out a raspy cough. Uh, I was good enough to give uh, Dr. Loomis a lift into town, officer, and I believe he left his glasses behind. Could you be good enough to allow me to return them to him? Whereabouts you suppose he's gone off to? Uh, if you'll just leave them with me, the deputy replied, I'll see to it the doctor gets them. If you don't mind, I'd like to return them personal, Sayer told him. The town's in a state of emergency, said the deputy. Leave them here. I'll tell him you dropped them off. Don't worry. A good motel's up the road a quarter mile. I'll tell him you're staying there if you wish to meet up with him. I can't tell how long he'll be, though. This is one hell of a night. It's all I can do for you. You can tell him that, the reverend said. But I'll keep those for him myself, you understand? Suit yourself. Sayer nodded to him, clutching the glasses, and solemnly bade him farewell. The face of the apocalypse would have to wait, he figured, but he knew fate would inevitably cross their paths. Some day. It was his destiny. It was its destiny. A motel a quarter mile up the street. It was all he had going for him now, and a night's lodging would do him good. 
Turning, he made his way to exit into the night. He opened the door and stepped outside. There, directly before him, stood the face of the apocalypse. Sayer gasped. The eyes behind the chalky white mask stared down upon him, a motionless cold. The glasses fell from the reverend's hands, dropping onto the ground. Taking a step away from the abomination, the heel of his shoe met with them, crushing them. His screams echoed into the cold breeze, and for a moment, no one heard them until it was too late. The husky bartender turned to the others. We're gonna fry his ass! Get your weapons, boys! You're all gonna die! A voice broke out from the direction of the neighboring public library and behind the hibiscus bushes. How can you expect to fry his ass when it don't work that way in the presence of apocalypse? The Reverend Jack Sayer stepped into view before them all, and all eyes turned. He was drunk and he staggered his way toward the crowd. His clothes were wrinkled and bloodied, and his hair was matted and unkempt. He looked like he'd been through hell. Who the hell are you? Ben Meeker insisted. Mr. Sayer, Loomis called out to him. You're an old fool. You shouldn't have lingered around. I can more than imagine what you've seen this night. I've beheld the face of apocalypse, said the reverend, and I can see no more. As he hobbled into the moonlight, black-red liquid streamed down his face in tears over dried blood, caked in layers across his unshaven cheeks and chin, and over his lips. The sockets of his eyes were hollow craters of pus and blood, sightless, yet the man remained capable of speaking his mind. Jesus! Earl exclaimed. You're all doomed to death! proclaimed Sayer. There's no stopping it! You're all dead, you and whoever else stands in its way. Meeker had enough, turned and spoke to one of the townies. Warren, your car here? Uh, no, Ben, I'm riding with Al. Meeker dug into his pocket and retrieved a key from his key ring. I'm trusting you to take Pierce's squad car and drive this man to the hospital pronto. It's a wonder he's still conscious or alive at all. There's a med pack in the front seat. You'll find some gauze and bandages to cover his eyes and help stop that bleeding. I don't know what else to do. Christ. So, yeah, the whole eyes being gone, you know, I would have liked to have seen the scene where that happened, <laughs> you know, when yeah. she went down. Um, but the thing I always loved about Halloween 4 is, uh, can you hear what I'm saying okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. <laughs> your, I think your ears are kind of burned off. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the thing I now every time I see my face up there with the teeth, I'm like feeling insecure. Uh, you look know, um, like a Freddy Krueger, like he's like a fo he's like a football coach at a middle school. He just has the hat on, like, all right, kids, so we're just gonna go play a couple rounds here. Oh, I want to take a second to show off some sweet uh, '80s slash librarian merch. Uh, can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I got yours too, man. Uh, after our next clip, I'll uh, show you. You're your telling stuff. me after 31 episodes, I got to retire evil bong? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I don't think that Chong is going to be too happy about that, uh, but we'll see. Um, he is in that movie, right? Yeah, Tommy Chong is the original owner of the evil bong. Yeah. Was, I think his wife got rid of it in a yard sale. He's like, man, I missed that bong. <laughs> <laughs> Would you agree that Halloween 4 is the most terrifying terrifying out of the original Halloween movies? It's creepy. I'll give it that. Um, I just remember, I remember 5 kind of bored me, like, going back and rewatching it. But 4 was creepy because, you know, Jamie is not, like, a teenager that's getting drunk and doing pot and all that. Um, Jamie is this little kid, and not only is she innocent... But a lot of people tend to blame her for what Michael did. So like you said, like you were saying in the interview, it's terrifying that nobody wants to help her because number one, they don't want to get killed by Michael. Number two, they hate her because of who she's connected to. So she's so alone. All she has is her foster sister who just wants to have her own life. 
So there's this incredible feeling of isolation and just darkness that you don't get in some of the other movies. Yeah, and it's just... It's and you're st- wondering, is Michael... Michael doesn't exactly have Jason's policy about not killing kids. I think no, Michael just, would push a kid in front of a bus. Dude, uh, Halloween 2018, he straight up murders that kid in the car, you know? It's like, shit! Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot about that. No that more. kid was operating a firearm, so... His whole innocence thing was kind of up in play anyway. <laughs> By the way, a second ago, my camera, like, moved to all on its own. Did you see that? I thought you did that. I was just like, okay. Oh, no, I, yeah, I did just now, but a couple minutes ago when you were talking. It just... Extreme close-up. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> um, anyways, I think the stakes are a lot higher in this book, and because she is so young, it makes it more scary. Uh, and the book really drives that home especially when she's trying to escape Michael towards the end of the book and she's making her way to uh, where she meets up with Loomis and they go to the school. She's running down the street away from Michael and people are like slamming their doors and locking the door, you know, and she's screaming, this little six-year-old girl screaming for help and the citizens of Haddonfield are locking and shutting their doors. You know, that is fucking terrifying. You made your own decision. Live with it. You're fucking bitch. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, shit. Um, but another clip I wanted to play before we get to the interview was uh, after the rooftop scene, which is also very intense in the book, um, when Jamie's making her way down the tree into the yard, uh, before she starts running from Michael, she has a vision of her mom. And uh, this is another thing that uh, Grabowski added uh, to the story that was not in the screenplay whenever he did his ex- uh, expanded edition. Right. And I want to share that. Uh, I want to share that clip with everybody here um, of Laurie Strode making an appearance in Halloween for uh, the novelization. Roll it. There you go. The other in fear and hatred. The little girl climbed down the tree as fast as her six year old body allowed her to her clown suit partially shredding and ripping against the bark and protruding branches. Halfway, she was forced to fight her way down amongst several branch groupings. Finally, she broke free and tumbled downward to the grass lawn below. Springing to her feet, she ran around to the front of the house where Rachel's body disappeared. There she was, Rachel lying quietly and motionless half in and half out of the hedges. Jamie rushed over to her. Come alive, Rachel! Kneeling, she wept and placed her foster sister's tilted head into her arms. She noticed a little dribble of dark blood running down the side of Rachel's head and neck. She sat there, rocking the teenager, trying failingly to bring her to her feet. Oh, please don't be dead, Rachel, please. Please don't be dead. Come alive, Rachel, come alive. Oh, please, come alive, come alive. But her friend and sister remained unmoving like a torn rag doll. Eyes closed and mouth silent. Jamie continued to sit there with her sobbing. Her despair over Rachel was overcome by the fearful notion that Uncle Michael could appear right behind her at any instant and catch her. Her eyes left Rachel at the impulse to turn, and she spun around to face the rest of the yard. The yard was empty but for the twisted moonlit web of shadow the tree cast, stretching into the blackness of the hedges and trellises of climbing roses. A section of the shadows began to move. What stepped out from the yard's black void wasn't Uncle Michael. Jamie remained still as the figure further advanced into view. As it drew closer beneath an illumination of nighttime sky, she began to make out who it was. It was a woman. It was her mother. Jamie breathed. Mommy! The woman wore what appeared to be a brightly colored nightgown, a trail of dark buttons and lace dripping down the front to a hem hung past her ankles. Her arms were crossed in a self-embrace as if she was cold. Then one hand extended out to her daughter. Jamie, spoke Lori Strode, her eyes never leaving the little girl. I need you to live for me. I want you to live for me. You're not going to give in and let him take you. Snap out of it. You must snap out of it and run. Go, run. Mommy, Jamie asked her, am I going to heaven now? But Mommy was suddenly no longer there. The spell of the vision was broken, replaced by the tangible reality of the masked shape of her uncle looming over her. Jamie immediately scrambled to her feet, leaving Rachel's body behind. 
She dashed across the lawn, nearly slipping on a streak of wetness, then reached the sidewalk and street. The silent stalker continued in pursuit. Down the street, at the center of the intersection, Jamie faltered minutely, considering a direction. Frantically, she chose one and continued to run amidst the street's all-consuming darkness. Darting furiously, she kept her gaze before her this time, fearing that if she looked back, she would see her nightmare man reaching out just inches from her back. In reality, the shadowy shape was in the distance walking, seemingly taking its time, as if in all confidence at winning its prey. As she ran, she cried out, hoping someone in the town would oblige her, praying someone would be able to hide her and save her. Help! Somebody help me! As she went, doors began to open around her, but as soon as they opened, they closed just as quickly, and the sounds of locks and deadbolts echoed and rang through her ears and fed her terror and helplessness. Somebody help me! But there was no use. The Nightmare Man did not stop coming. He would never stop. Jamie, you must go to the Dagobah system. Wait, what? <laughs> this is floating apparition. Um, yeah, I thought that was good. I mean, it definitely adds a creepy element. I mean, it's like they say with Guillermo del Toro. Just because a ghost is in a movie doesn't mean it has to be the, either the central point of the movie or to scare. It could be an illusion. It could be the person yeah. grappling with something. So I don't think a ghost being in this book really ruined the book. I mean, because it, it doesn't... I better. Yeah, it's not like it grabbed the knife out of Michael's hand or something. I mean, it didn't affected it, it was an illusion it was well that's that's my perception of the scene i like yeah. it um here's your mug that's coming to you man oh well if i can get it to here's your mug that slips out of the hand breaks well you know <laughs> you already have one like this and i could act like i'm handing it to you that would have been cool yeah um so yeah this 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 book is a great novelization it doesn't steer too far from the actual story from the movie but it really does pick up and, and put across the uh, terror and the, the high stakes of the movie. And it's got a really cool ending as far as Michael's death. Because it's a little more extreme in the book than it is in the movie. He gets ran over a little more. Uh, gets uh, you know He ends up getting shot up, thrown down the well, and then a stick of dynamite thrown down behind him. Like I'm the kind book. of picturing like uh, Sonny and Godfather, where like they they empty the rounds, then they kick him in the face, and then put more <laughs> rounds into him, kind of like that. Makes sense. I mean, for all the chaos Michael's caused in this town. Yeah, and, and the way Gravowski wrote it, there would be no bringing Michael back, dude. This guy <laughs> was ran over like twenty times, shot a thousand times and then blown up with a stick of dynamite. The dude was done. <laughs> and um, I really enjoyed the, the original ending, uh, the way the story should have gone, which we're going to talk about with Nicholas, uh, with Michael being dead and Jamie taking over. And the way he wrote that final scene really puts you in the moment with, with Jamie killing uh, her, uh, killing, uh, killing the mom and uh, Loomis's reaction to it. Oh, Loomis was a little more extreme in the book. Go ahead. Speaking of, speaking of finality, um, not just with this novelization, but if you remember with Halloween 2, they found pieces of Michael and Loomis, and they're just like, how the fuck are they going to battle in the fourth one? <laughs> like, there, there are pieces of them everywhere. Oh, God. Uh, talking about novelizations, every time I get a new comment on uh, <laughs> the Dream Master book, yeah. it's like, I thought these people died... In the dream in the Dream Warriors book, <clears throat> and I'm like, okay, the Dream Warriors book, <clears throat> losing my voice. The Dream Warriors book <laughs> is based on an original script, the script before they changed it. Yeah. The Dream Master book is based on the movie, and I, I keep having to explain this. Anybody who listens to those, the Dream the Dream Warriors book is based on Wes Craven's script, really, and the Dream Master book is based on the movie. So the continuity is a little fickle between those two. That's right. 
situation. But this book, like I said, pretty much sticks to the story. But he, he has a very good writing style that really puts you in there, makes you feel the terror, makes you feel the suspense. Uh, we're going to play the interview with him, and we're going to talk a little more about the book and give our rating afterwards. Uh, but yeah, you ready for the interview, Sean? Roll it. Our, our first question really is uh, how did how did this opportunity uh, come to you with uh, Halloween Four? Well, well, um, I uh, I've been uh, uh, just on a little side note. I've been like writing all of my life, even though mm -hmm. most of the first half of my life was like in church. So I was more like a closet horror writer in a way. Um, but I started writing my first novel in. Um, my 10th grade math class because I was bored turned into Prey Serpent's Prey, which was supposed to originally be a kind of like a religious kind of a, um, a book with demons in it that you cast out at the end uh, because you believe in God. And then things happened in my personal life with this one girl. So I kind of turned evil and I took the book and I, I just totally like, uh, 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 messed it up in such a way that it makes it more like a, no, it's not Jesus -y at all anymore and stuff. Uh, anyway, I was uh, uh, while I was doing this, I was uh, all around Los Angeles trying to be an actor, and I ended up at, in a class um, by um, uh, that was taught by Walter Koenig, who plays Chekhov in the original Star Trek series. And oh, cool. um, yeah, and uh, he 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 taught me a lot. That was a great experience back back in the day. But um, he was coming out with a science fiction novel called Buck Ellis and the Actor Robot. And uh, his publisher's sister was in our class. So I said, hey, I've been working on this like uh, this uh, book, uh, this horror book and stuff, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm done with it. I, I believe I was actually done with it when I talked to her. But anyway, yeah, she said, well, sure, I'll, I'll um, uh, just when you're ready, uh, uh, just send it to me and I'll send it to my brother in New York. And so that happened one day. I got a phone call from her brother in New York saying that, hey, I really like the book. I can't believe that you're you're 21. I think it was 21. And he was like blown away with how young I was to write a book like this. Uh, and, you know, and then it turns out that uh, Walter Koenig read it, read it later. And he uh, talked to the publisher and said, how can you publish something so amateurish? But anyway, at least I got published with it. Two months yeah. later, after I um, signed the deal with publishing that, um, I well, <clears throat> I quit my job. I thought that I had it made, and and the publisher said that he was going to send me other projects. So I had to do like other projects, like romance novels, uh, using the pen name Marcina Shane, and like I did a book called Great Legs in Six Weeks, because you know I didn't know anything about legs. I just went to the library, but they paid me a hundred bucks to do it. And, hey. and so I just started doing stuff like that. One day I got a phone call saying, uh, you know, uh, Michael Myers, right? The Halloween series. Um, I'm going, well, yeah, uh, John Carpenter, Halloween. Um, and uh, uh, they weren't supposed to do any more, obviously, after two. Um, and they said uh, they, they brought him back. Um, they're filming right now and uh, they, they got a screenplay. Um, and uh, this deal fell in our laps, and we thought of you. So how would you like to do the novelization? We'll send you the screenplay in the mail. Um, and the thing is, you have a month to do it, and uh, uh, you'll get paid $1,000 for it. And I said, oh, wow, great. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I, I know the movie, so Michael Myers is back. Wow, what fun, and I get to actually do the book. So that, that was great. Back uh, then, also, I was living in a back room of a, a friend's uh, parents' house. So I had like my own little like um, nook in my room with my typewriter. And I just uh, w went through the screenplay once I got it. And, and I never did anything like that before. So I just started with the first, uh, with the first couple of sentences, uh, which I think in my novelization, the first couple of sen sentences are or the first like small paragraph, maybe three or four sentences, are exactly the way the screenplay is written, and then I just okay. went from there, and then everything just started. I started making up. I started visualizing the scenery and and stuff and what's going on, and there was uh, probably some things, definitely some things that they took out of the screenplay, like little yeah. minuscule parts 
because after when I saw the movie, I noticed things that uh, that were different. But uh, yeah, so and it took me a month to do it, and uh, basically after a month, I never got the contract yet. Um, the uh, publisher was kind of not returning most of my calls, still giving me a couple of assignments that they would like to pay me a hundred dollars in advance for. But um, uh, I, I just decided, well, okay, the, what could go wrong? So I sent them the contract, and uh, uh, and then you know a few months go by and stuff, and then the book finally gets released in October, along with *Prey Serpents*, *Prey*, my first novel, same month, okay. um, and uh, I never got paid for both of the books, I never got the advancement for you know for uh, *Prey Serpents*, *Prey*, none of that stuff, and. Uh, really? Just to make a long story short, uh, Critics' Choice Paperbacks went out of business, filed for bankruptcy. I like talked to agents and, and people and stuff, trying to get like paid for it, and it turned out I never, uh, to this day, had a contract for it, and I never got paid for it either. Never got paid for the for the for your first book or Halloween Four. Right. That is, right. That's that is just ludicrous. That's crazy. Um, Another thing talk- too is. On a oh. side note, uh, my first book was under Nicholas Randers. I thought I'd call myself Nicholas Randers instead of Grabowski. Grabowski is like too long. I've encountered a lot of people that for some reason or other can't pronounce it. So I thought Randers. But when Halloween 4 came out and I first saw the cover, it had my real name on it. So I I made a phone call and I said, well, uh, uh, I never gave you permission to use my real name on it. Oh, no, no, no. We like your real name a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I and then it it just stuck and I and I kind of felt and I kind of feel to this day too that more often than not if you're gonna you if you're thinking about using a pen name in writing and you want to take your writing career seriously more often than not it's better to keep your real name uh, I don't know I just kind of grown to think that way but that's how the cards fell so I got I got to tell you just for me anyways Grabowski. Kind of grabs the attention more than than Randers, but that's just me. Um, well, I learned that over I, I the years. Yeah, Grabowski is more unique. Randers, even though you don't hear it very often, it no. sounds generic. So, uh, I was going to ask you. You kind of answered this question a little bit already uh, when you said that uh, some of the things from the screenplay ended up different in the movie. Uh, which kind of uh, – because we've talked to some authors who wrote original works in these franchises, uh, but we're not – we haven't really got to talk about the workings of doing like a novelization as much. Um, so these differences that were in the book, those were in the original screenplay. Like they didn't give you – did you have any input for any little extras or anything, or did it all have to be directly from the screenplay? They didn't really give me any rules. So okay. I just took the screenplay and just went with it, and I added a few like little tidbits of my own, uh, like um, a book of matches that say something personal on it that's part of the scene that I just happened to mention, or you know something really small like that. It's not until um, I uh, the Halloween 25 convention came along and I um, I did the special edition. I thought that. I would use a lot of the ideas that I always had in my head and put them on paper in like expanded chapters and stuff, especially the Reverend Sayer stuff. I mean, yeah, they, they that was my gave next him that question, small scene, Reverend. and I thought that it was it would be great to expand. And because of the mythology of uh, the Halloween movies and everything, I I thought yeah, I got to have. Um, What's her name? Jamie Lee Curtis's character just being it as a ghost somewhere in it. So I just managed to. So that gave me a, an opportunity um, to expand. But when I did the original novelization for mass market paperbacks, um, uh, I, uh, I I wasn't sure what I was doing, and it was all new. And being that they didn't tell me what I could or couldn't do. I didn't really yeah. think of anything else except for what was really in front of me on the screenplay. So I didn't really expand on any stuff. But the stuff that was already in there, though, um, I can't off the top of my head, like expanded scenes, um, probably with what's-her-name and what's-his-face, I forgot their names, in, in front of the fireplace. 
um, and uh, in and stuff. They just expanded scenes, uh, extra dialogue and stuff. That when oh, I finally saw the movie in the theaters, I noticed because I was so familiar with the story. Oh, they didn't say that. But it's not really anything that fans could. Uh, I'll tell you one thing. I, I, I got to say this. When I read the screenplay and I worked on the book and finished the book and all that jazz, I thought it was the greatest idea to have Jamie at the end of it turn into the villain. Oh, yeah. That's what I thought happened. I, I thought, oh, the, well, if they're going to make another one, it, they're going to switch to her now. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I, I thought that that was a cool idea. And then they changed their minds. Oh, God, yes, they did. Me and Sean, that's something we agree on. Uh, the ending to Halloween 4 should have been left alone, you know, and the series should have went forward that way <clears throat> because uh, the way it ended was just a perfect ending for Michael, I think, and a perfect setup for his niece. Um, well, there's, but, yeah. one, there's one book I just heard about um, because I was doing some research on Halloween for this particular interview, and there's one book, um, I think it's the same person who wrote Slash of the Titans, which goes into what happened behind the scenes of Freddy vs. Jason, but it was talking about the 40 different rejected scripts for Halloween at the different directions they want to go, because you can almost see for Halloween 4 and Halloween 5, it, it's, a, it's a complete tonal shift, you know, as far as what happens with Jamie and whatnot, but well, that's yeah. what makes it so interesting going back and rereading Halloween 4 because of all the the little things, because I remember the priest getting blinded. I mean, that was just really vivid, um, reading the novelization going into that. Oh, yeah, that was my own thing. I, I thought that uh, that had to happen. That's what I would have wanted to see. And, and I thought, you know, you have to expand on his character, but make it interesting, have something happen to him. Right. Yeah, because in the movie, he's just kind of a write-off character, but he, he was really intriguing, you know, the actual character of Sayer. So getting to expand on that character, it's 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 awesome to hear that that was actually something uh, you added. You know that wasn't something that was in the original story because it felt like a missed opportunity with the character, and it's cool that you uh, took advantage of that. And uh, the the Lori scene, like the ghost or hallucination or whatever that Jamie's seeing, I think that adds just reading it, you know, uh, narrating it and everything. It's kind of like a chilling scene because you know who's really standing in front of her coming at her. But she's seeing, um, you know, she's seeing her mom. And uh, it, it, I thought that was pretty powerful, uh, pretty powerful stuff there. Um, okay. I, I want to ask your opinion on, on part of the story. Because um, <clears throat> the way you write it, uh, it, it, it's more vivid than the movie was when Jamie is fleeing from Michael. And uh, all these people just shutting their doors to her, you know. Um, is Do you think the... Uh, what, what's the word I'm looking here for, Sean? The feeling in Haddonfield, like they knew that it was Michael. <clears throat> you know, Kind of hopelessness, was, maybe? <clears throat> yeah, like he was back, and uh, we're not helping that girl because Michael's after her, that sort of thing, you know? I think pretty much if something like that – I've never lived in a town like that. If something like that happened, became <clears throat> famous for like some guy that killed a lot of them. Um, and, you know, it was something that – it genuinely happened, and it became town lore. Uh, they probably, yeah, it, it's probably along those lines. Well, that, it's not uh, that they're very they're almost vilified thing. because they're they're you know, treating they didn't her like have, they didn't her want to be killed, <laughs> so they'll have none of yeah. that. Well, it made the scene even more terrifying. Uh, you know, this little girl. It's already. I got to say, Halloween Four is the most terrifying Halloween movie with Michael Myers, in my opinion. And it has a lot to do with, like, the hopelessness and it being, like, this little kid, you know. And that scene just drove that even further, in my opinion, uh, you know, them shutting the doors and stuff. And in the movie, it's not really there, but, like, what I was trying to get at was how I pre appreciated in your writing of it how you, you know, you, you pulled that out and put it under a microscope for a second and made that a part of the scene that not only was she fleeing from Michael, but anybody that could help her. Is like, you know, they're shutting their door and locking it. You're on your own, little kid. And it just made it more terrifying. Um, so, thanks. yeah, thanks for that. Um, Sean, uh, it, you had some questions too, right? Um, actually, you're pretty 
good with uh, kind of answering them with your explanations because um, yeah, I, I no, want to right? know more about how it was going to go into the adaptation because I, I think we we've read we've read a couple of the novelizations where they're really far off. I mean, the novelization of Halloween one is really it really goes in a completely different direction with the whole Celtic war, the spirit that controls Michael, uh, what Michael's thinking when he sees people. And, you know, I wasn't sure how much creative control you had over that when you were adapting that. So, um, yeah, that <laughs> interesting how that happened where they just kind of gave you a month. Cause, um, That's I know no, no, November in the year is a big month for a lot of people who try to write a book like in a month, see if they can do it. But I can't imagine the pressure there <laughs> to do that. Yeah, I, I was just starting out too. I I was 21. I just got the first novel published. I hadn't published anything, not even a short story prior to that. So I was like uh, uh, doing somersaults and kissing the neighbors and and stuff. Uh, and I I thought, like I said, uh, you know, I quit my job and and everything, thinking that I had it made then because of that. And you know, even to this day, a lot of authors, first time authors, think that all I have to do is just publish this book and I've got it made, man. But no, <laughs> that's not true. Um, not usually, anyway. Uh, I keep yeah, hearing so. about these deadlines uh, with like authors in these horror like novelizations. <laughs> kind of, like, they don't give them much time, and uh, you know, you're not the first author that said that they were kind of done wrong. Uh, it's like they they want to put these books out just to capitalize on the movie, like at one point, but they don't really. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like they're taking. They they didn't take care of the author, and it, it's really a shame that that happened because it's it's a very good novel. It's, it's an incredible novelization. It's you really capture the uh, terror and fear from the movie, which is the most terrifying, in my opinion, Halloween movie in the franchise. Um, what kind of doors opened up for you uh, after after the Halloween four book was uh, was released? Uh, not very many. I. Um... I really tried, uh, though, to uh, to make it into magazines. I wrote, like, short story after short story, sent them in, got rejected, and uh, and and stuff. I um, made it to a lot of, living in Southern California, I uh, made it to a lot of, like, the fango conventions and horror conventions that were around L.A. and uh, kind of hobnobbed and things. And, and, um, uh, and Halloween 4 got me... Uh, I, a little bit of like a pat on the back from, uh, you know, meeting new people. And I yeah. remember one time when I, uh, I I was at this like huge like nightclub watching this band that a friend of mine was in on stage. And then he uh, he saw that I was in the audience and he stopped the music and he pointed to me and he shouted, Halloween 4! <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Everybody kind of looked at me and looked at him and didn't know what he was talking about. Then he just started the music again. And nothing substantial. I was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get to where I, I am today. Um, and back then, I like uh, would I even kind of, um, because I wanted to stick to writing, I reduced myself to being involved in a place called the Word Factory, which doesn't exist anymore, over in Orange, California. And... Uh, um, uh, they mostly did people's term papers for them. So it's oh. like uh, they were paid for that. The students from universities would actually pay them to do their their term papers and research papers for them. And, and it was, I ended up like doing this girl's term paper and then she like ended up suing them or something. I don't know, but I, I was out of there. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, and you know, and just kind of pretty much failing at things. Um, and then I, around about 2000, when I got my first computer, uh, I started becoming aware of um, print-on-demand and stuff. Uh, it's when I first started being capable of publishing my own things mm -hmm. and having some control instead of waiting for somebody else to publish me um, that I, I think I got my foot in the door further that way and that's what led to Halloween 4 about a year or two after I got my first computer um, I hooked up with Anthony Massey who actually called me um, one day out of the blue and said hi I'm Anthony Massey I'm running the uh, um, uh, 
25 Years of Terror uh, Halloween Convention in Pasadena, and uh, I know that you wrote the book for Halloween 4, and we'd like you to be a special guest. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll give you a room, we'll treat you like uh, all the other special guests and all the uh, hoopla. So I, I went, really? Okay. And that's what really, it's the special edition and my appearance there that and my ability to publish myself, because that was basically a self-published book. Um, and yeah. learning eventually how to properly design, do book covers and things. That's why I'm a publisher now is because I, I, I've all my life, I like doing things myself. Sometimes I didn't, but life would like make me. <laughs> so I just, uh, I, I, that's, that's the process of how I, you know, how Halloween four helped me. It didn't help me in the nineties. It only started helping <laughs> me when I was learning how to help myself. It just sounds like the original, like when it first went down, it was just kind of like a cluster, you know, like I don't want to say the whole word there, but uh, it doesn't sound like they treated you very professional at all. And uh, that's really, that really sucks because it was a great novelization that a lot of people, uh, you know, people still are seeking that thing, you know, and wanting it, uh, and especially the expanded one. And you were talking about the conventions. Uh, and when you wrote the expanded edition, and that's where you got the uh, inspiration for the short story that you included. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, the falling that I put in my uh, first uh, collection of uh, short stories, uh, diverse tales. Uh, Could you uh, tell us? Uh, yeah, what, what yeah, yeah I that pushed it elsewhere too. Huh. I was going to say, could you uh, share with our listeners what led what what it was exactly that inspired that story uh, from from going to the conventions? Well, um, uh, I can tell you, this, I, I, I've been to many conventions, and uh, um, and this one was my first taste of being treated like a real celebrity uh, because people flocked around me. I went the whole the hotels were like livid. Uh, the people were partying the whole, all the hotels were like one big massive party. Uh, it was not like some of these where, you know, you try to find where the party is in this hotel. The whole thing was a party. So, and, uh, a lot of them that I went to, they were high up They're like on the 14th floor or whatever. And, um, and I, I would party with the one guy was like smoking a hookah out on the balcony with a few other people. And I'm going, you know, this, uh, um, the guardrail on this is only like four feet high. We're like, how how um, far up are we? And what if somebody like just kind of goes over? It's right. like there's, yeah, it's like, and people were drugged there. I, I, so I, I imagine that. So I took that vision home with me, and I just started thinking of how to expand that as a short story, and it just got that way. Ooh. Didn't know what that was. Um, we okay. still got everybody. Yeah, oh, I think that was my phone. My bad. Okay, just making sure. I didn't know if somebody got disconnected. Uh, you hear about a lot of authors using like nightmares and dreams and experiences like yours uh, for inspiration. And uh, in horror, that sounds like the way to go. Uh, you picture you picture like a scenario like that where something tragic could happen and uh, you run with it. And that, that's I'm, I'm going to include that. Uh, since you said it was cool to narrate it uh, at the end of the podcast, uh, sure. the narration of the falling, uh, I enjoyed that one. I think the my listeners will enjoy it too. Um, we had some questions. I've already asked a couple of them from subscribers. One person asked me, uh, and I'm not kidding. Uh, they said what wanted me to ask why Michael on top of the house was omitted from the book. And I was trying to explain. I was like, well, you see, that's like a movie thing. You know, you can't really – that's like a quick little scene in a movie. I don't even see how that could be transferred to the page, you know. Uh, it, it just wouldn't work the same. So that's the answer yeah. right there, I'm sure. Is, is that is that the, that's the answer, right? I mean – Well, you know, I I think it was something they added after I got their version of the screenplay. I think that okay. was something that that was added uh, during production when I had a version of the screenplay that didn't happen to have it in it. I think that's it, because I, I, my mission I remember to myself was to uh, just not take anything out, 
just add stuff if I wanted to, but never okay. take anything out when I was writing the book. So everything that's in the book is in the screenplay that I used. Okay. Well, there you go, uh, subscriber. Um, and uh, can I ask you a couple – just or, Sean, do you have any more questions about the novelization itself before I move on? Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up is um, you've had, uh -huh. you've had a couple of years to reflect on writing this. I was wondering if you would have done anything differently. I mean, you might, you might have answered that because we, we've been talking a lot, but I was just one question in my head. Question. Yeah. As far um, as like the direction of the book. I can't imagine not doing it any differently. Um, I, I think if I had another chance to write a book based on somebody's screenplay, um, I would try to have it as close to the movie as possible, just making it as vivid as I can uh, with how I weave the scenes, to, you know, with details, and add a few other things to, like, further explain something to make it sound more real, whatever is needed. But I would still, like, uh, you know, I wouldn't just go off and have people go, you know what, this novelization is, like, funky compared to the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like the first time. That's what I thought back then, and I, I think I still think that now, uh, because it's a novelization. It's supposed to represent the movie and yeah. and hopefully add a few things that the movie doesn't, but not take away. Yeah, not change it completely, you know. Or change it um, like that. Because there's a couple novelizations that were based on, like, scripts that were completely changed before they shot the movie, and, uh, you know – <laughs> That's just, those are just like uh, Nightmare on Elm Street three was based like more on the Wes Craven script than the shooting script, for instance. But uh, uh, yeah, like I think, think Freddie used to be a Freddie used to be a pimp in that one, I think. Oh in, God, in that there's version, so much. That, that was just, that was weird. Yeah, instead <laughs> of the puppet scene, instead of the puppet scene, he just drags the guy down a hallway and throws him in front of a van. It's 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 weird. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I got to ask, though, just a Halloween question, and then I was, I was going to ask about some stuff you've done since then. Uh, as a horror fan, what is, in your opinion, the best Michael Myers mask? Oh, the best Michael Myers mask? Um, <laughs> unfortunately, not for. It was too yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, pasty and plain. Um, <laughs> you know, I think... If I think about it, I maybe the first and the last. Oh, there okay. he is. Got him back. <clears throat> we got you back. HBO we, we wasn't lost too bad, first. too. HBO. H2O <laughs> wasn't too bad. Um, but I think I like the first and the last best. Okay. Uh, so, you know, you're not going to believe this. A lot of people on my channel have told me that they like part six, Mask. And that hmm. always catches me by surprise, but I hear it so much, and I was just curious if, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask everybody from now on what they think, see if that pops up more, uh, but I didn't understand that. I kind of like Rob Zombie's uh, Myers mask, but I do enjoy the original and the one in 2018. Um, are you guys still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so since then… With your publishing company, you have been helping out a lot of other uh, authors getting their foot in the door of writing, correct? Right. <clears throat> you want to talk a little bit about Black Bed Sheet uh, Publications? Yeah. Um, you know, um, being that I was getting uh, um, the hang of uh, what it takes to actually put a book together myself and publish it through, like, print on demand and whatnot – I started realizing, hey, I can publish other people. So I, I did an experiment with a friend of mine uh, that I worked at Walmart uh, with in the 90s, uh, Jake, and uh, published a poetry book of his <clears throat> and uh, called myself Diverse Media at the time and published a couple of other small things. And some of my stuff I like dug into my file cabinets, came out with a few things like The Wicked Haze, which is a bunch of like oddball stories and things, uh, just to, you know, have a little body of, bigger body of work while I was promoting myself. And um, and then uh, uh, one thing kind of led to another, and I decided to, like, just become a bona fide publisher. Um, people were, like, uh, 
uh, I, you know, uh, you know, one thing that made that happen was um, there was a, a company called Triad Publishing that um, published a few of my works, and they were supposed to do Red Wet Dirt, um, and it was all set to come out that October. And there's a lot of friends of mine that were authors that were being published by them too at a time at the time, and um, uh, we were all in a anthology together and. Uh, it, uh, published by them, and it was really neat. And all of a sudden, the guy started having, who ran the company, started having, like, divorce issues. And then he bailed out on everybody. He owed everybody a lot of money. Red, wet dirt didn't come out. Um, and uh, and then I just, people were so pissed off, and he just disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, and I decided... After all that I've been through too with publishers and stuff, why not just be the publisher that I I always wanted to be published uh, with? So I took these people and um, started my own publishing company. Started publishing them. Looked for other authors. I published Red Wet Dirt by myself. And uh, that year, 2009, actually, well, it started 2008, but 2009. <laughs> was when uh, um, I started getting a nice roster, a l nice lineup of, of authors, and started um, taking us all to conventions uh, around the country and and different things. And, and uh, I've been doing that ever since. Um, only nowadays it's like even bigger and better. And I've always been about honesty, about reputation, about um, – uh, and you know, and since I'm small too, I mean, I go through life, life problems and life troubles and things, and people kind of just um, there's a nice ebb and flow, to where um, I always have it, I always do what I say I'm going to do. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer than usual, but um, I, I and somehow, um, I uh, Black Bedsheet Books now has a better reputation than it ever has before. Uh, we got like a like so many authors now, about almost like 175, something like that. And uh, we're all over the Internet, and we've been all over the, the country and, and stuff uh, doing what we do. It's a, it's a powerhouse for something so small. I run it out of my parents' garage, literally. I uh, decided to move in to my parents' house to take care of them. They started getting uh, dementia really bad, and I set up the whole garage as an apartment-slash-office, and I've been running it here ever since. And uh, it's, uh, you know, I, and it's the best decision that I've ever made in my life. Uh, great stuff. Uh, I'm all about that. I know how to do it. I know the people in the business. And I'm passionate about my own stuff, too. So it all kind of works together. And it, and it helps, and it gives a helping hand, you know, like, like you were hoping that you could have found back then, you know, and some of that stuff, right? Um, yeah, that's that's a, a a big thing behind my passion too is what I I used to go through and stuff. So and I, I'm really big on uh, publishing unsung talent, trying to get their feet in the door, um, and you know stuff like that. It's it's really great it, uh, to the extent that I I want to keep doing this until I die, practically. I mean not practically, yeah. Um, and uh, and then some for somebody to say. Uh, Hey, uh, he uh, he helped all these people get their foot in the door to being great writers, and and uh, that that's something that makes me happy. It's my lot in life. I told you before that I uh, the first half of my life was in church and stuff. Um, yeah. I, I still that's a whole other can of worms, but I, I'm still a believer and whatnot. But at the same time, along the same lines. Um, me finding my lot in life doing this enriches my soul better than in church. Oh, that's a, that's a heavy statement. That's great. I, I wish we could all be lucky, you know, to, to have that. Uh, all we can do is do our best, and it sounds like that's what you're doing, and you're helping out a lot of people. And uh, everybody check out, uh, check out the website. I'm going to put a link uh, in the description. But do you want to say the website? Um, huh? Did you want to say your uh, public the the website for Black Bed Sheet? Oh, yes, certainly. 
Um, it's uh, blackbedsheetbooks.com. I also have a personal website that leads to that website, too, and it's got, like, pages and pages of stuff uh, about me and, you know, <laughs> everything with writing and my life and stuff. It's like a... Well, anyway, it's uh, downwarden.com, D-O-W-N-W-A-R-D-E-N.com. It's all things Grabowski on there. And I'll have these in the description, too, listeners, if you want to check them out. Uh, please take the time to do so. He's got a great story, and he's doing some uh, good stuff for other authors out there. Uh, Sean, did you have any closing questions? Oh, my last closing question would be, what advice would you give new authors? Uh, don't pay any money to anyone to get you published. Um, have yourself be published under its own merits because people will take advantage of you if they're asking for money outright. Uh, maybe, you know, an editor, really good editor, uh, that's something different, but not publishing. Um, self-publish if you may. But it's better for your career if you take yourself seriously and your writing seriously to be published under your own merits for people to actually look at something that you wrote and say, hey, wow, I want to publish this. And then they go ahead and publish it and invest in you. And then you get a percentage or they pay you somehow you know, for it. So, you know, <laughs> don't let other people take advantage of you. Oh, yeah, there's and there's, there's a lot of scams when it's that, too, you know, asking you to pay for it. Um, just, just out of my own personal experience when I was a teenager, uh, I wrote this poem and it was, uh, somebody submitted it to this book that was getting put out and they wanted people to pay. You had to pay to get it in there, you know, and the book never even got published, you know, nobody ever got it. Um, so stuff like that happens too, but definitely, yeah. definitely that the way, what he just said is great advice. I think, um, excellent. So, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, w- thank you for coming and talking with us and, you know, yeah, answering thank you. questions. Our subscribers yeah, were welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're very we, welcome. Thanks for inviting me to be on the show, too. And we finally hey. did it. We did the show. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. It's going to be a fantastic perfect. episode for Halloween night. Exactly. It's going to awesome. be a Halloween episode. So I uh, thought that was, uh, that was perfect. Um, but, yeah, thank you for writing – the, the novelization of Halloween 4, and thank you for all you've done, uh, you know, in your career and what you're doing for other authors. Um, it's a great story, and uh, you're, doing, you're doing some great work, and uh, we all appreciate you. And uh, have a happy Halloween, Nicholas. Thank well, you thank so much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, and you too. Happy Halloween, everybody. It's the best time of year. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I'll talk to you guys. Uh, I'll talk to you guys later then. Okay. Right, thank you thank so you. much, man. Thanks. Thanks for taking okay, the time. Thank for you. Us. Take care. So yeah, that's our interview with Nicholas Grabowski, the author. It's crazy he didn't get paid for this book, man. That is fucked up. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, he got the notoriety from it and stuff, but uh, he even said that that didn't really get the ball rolling for him more so than you know the early two thousands did. Right, and, uh, the convention circuit and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot I can say about the book more than we have than we before the interview and what we talked about in the interview. Because right. if you've seen if you've seen the movie, the book is you know the book pretty much stays the same except for the you know a couple of the clips we played. Some of the deaths are a little more gruesome. Uh, the descriptions are good. The character uh, development is good. I guess we get a little more in into the characters' heads. Right. And, uh, you know, I think I would give this book, honestly, I'm going to give it a four. Uh, I would give it a five, but I agree with him saying that a novelization should, I'm not, can't hardly talk to this mask, <laughs> say my S's. I agree that a, a novelization should, should stick to the movie, but it is nice to have the extras, and he gives us a couple extras there. But I feel like there might have, there could have been just you know a little bit more, a little more expanded, getting to Michael's head a little more, right? Uh, you know. But I give it a four. I think it was a great book, and I really enjoyed narrating it. I think Loomis. That's something we didn't touch on a lot. We didn't really play any Loomis clips, right? Um, 
Well, as my wife says, Loomis is a drama queen, so we can only imagine the horror. <laughs> yeah, you know, Loomis is a is turned up to ten in this book compared to the movies and the other books. So definitely check out the Loomis stuff. Um, yeah, give it a four. What do you give it? I, I agree with that. I I agree with each of your sentiments. So a four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A four a great for book. Ha- Halloween four. Halloween 4 gets a 4. I wasn't even thinking that when I said it. Yeah. Um, check it out. There's going to be a uh, thumbnail at the end to check it out. Be sure to check out those websites Nicholas talked about in the interview. They'll be in the description below. And uh, I hope you all I hope you all have a happy Halloween. Uh, hope you're enjoying the content on the channel. We're, at, we're a little over two years into the narrations now. 31 episodes. Poetic of uh out of print slashers 30 episodes of after the slash on patreon yeah and 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 episode 10 of slash tracks dropped today too uh, on halloween so things are rocking and rolling and uh thank you all so much for listening uh you're all amazing be excellent to each other out there pleasant dreams and happy halloween bitch And this is Sean Campbell saying, if this one doesn't scare you, riddle me this. Can Bruce Wayne and Batman ever truly coexist? We'll find out today. (laughs) Click that thumbnail. We'll see you later.